Welcome everyone to It's Time to Write Your Story, King's Authors on Writing Memoir. I'm Jillian Turnbull, Director of the School of Writing and Publishing at the University of King's College in Halifax. And with me today, I have our four author panelists who I will introduce to you in just a moment. I also have with me our nonfiction cohort directors, Kim Pittaway and Dean Job, And we're all here to answer your questions that you may have about the program, uh, which you're welcome to add to our discussion in the second part of the session. So more on how to do that in just a second. Uh, our panelists are all graduates of the MFA in Creative Nonfiction. And today they're gonna talk to you about writing memoir. Uh, they're going to discuss the different ways that they brought um, their life story to the page, discussing the surprises, challenges, ethical issues, and creative possibilities they discovered as they wrote. They're going to talk, too, about how to thread your own story into a bigger narrative by exploring the themes that anchored their books and how they connected individual tales to more universal stories. So the way we're going to structure today's uh, session is our panelists are going to each give a short talk on the writing and publishing process for their individual memoirs. After that, we're going to move into a Q&A segment. So I'll ask our authors a couple of questions to get us going, and then we'll open the floor to all of you. Um, you'll be able to put all of your questions into the Q&A, uh, and you can find that button at the bottom of your screen. You can open that up and type your questions into the box there and I will read them out to our participants. Uh, and just a reminder, we're in webinar mode here in Zoom, so um, that means your microphones uh, and cameras are muted. You don't have to worry about appearing in uh, this video, and we are recording this video, so uh, if there was any portion that you missed or that you want to review again, it will be posted to our King's YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow. All right, so I'm going to introduce our authors here, and... Uh, put us into uh, slideshow mode. There we go. All right, so first up is Pauline Dakin. Uh, Pauline is the best-selling author of Run, Hide, Repeat, a memoir of a fugitive childhood, which won the prestigious 2018 Edna Stabler Prize for Creative Nonfiction and was named one of the best 100 books of 2017 by the Globe and Mail. Run, Hide, Repeat was re-released by Penguin Canada in August of 2022. It is also the subject of a five-part podcast series of the same name with CBC Podcasts and is being developed as a documentary and a feature film. Pauline is a professor of journalism at the University of King's College and an award-winning journalist who was for many years a health reporter for CBC National News, as well as the host of the regional documentary program, Atlantic Voice. Sue Harper is a retired teacher who has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, an MA in English, and an MFA in Creative Nonfiction. She is working on the third book in a series she has co-authored entitled Time to Wonder, A Kid's Guide to BC's Regional Museums. Sue has written for Nouveau Magazine, Okanagan Life, France Magazine, New Zealand's North and South Magazine, and Forest and Bird. In 2019, she published her memoir, Winter in the City of Light, a search for self in retirement. She's the only person she knows who has explored all six hectares of Paris's Louvre Museum. Jason Schurz is a music and mental health writer, host of the internationally renowned Scream Therapy podcast and self-proclaimed punk weirdo living in Powell River, BC on the traditional territory of the Tlamin Nation. He has contributed to Visions Journal, Transition Magazine, OC87 Recovery Diaries, and New Noise Magazine. When he's not writing, podcasting, facilitating a bipolar support group, or doing other mental health advocacy work, he's screaming into dented microphones and beating on his guitar like it's a percussion instrument. Jason's first book, Scream Therapy, A Punk Journey Through Mental Health, is available for pre-order now and is out May 1st from Mansfield Press. And our final panelist is R.C. Shaw, who is the author of Louisburg or Bust, which was nominated for the 2018 Margaret and John Savage First Book Award for Nonfiction. He has written for The Globe and Mail, The Surfer's Journal, Beach, Gr or, sorry, Beach <laughs> Grit Magazine, The Coast, and The Chronicle Herald. He holds an MFA in Creative Nonfiction from the University of King's College in Halifax. When not teaching high school, English, and biology, he can be found in the waves near his home in Cow Bay, Nova Scotia. 
As founder of the Kobe, a Cow Bay concert series, he has brought musical acts such as Bahamas, Matt Mays, Jen Grant, and Rose Cousins to his community hall. An avid and long-standing surfer, Ryan remains a sailing novice. Reading dozens of sailing books is the extent of his experience, but undaunted, one of his life goals is to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. He plans to enroll in a Learn to Sail summer camp in the near future, likely alongside his preteen kids, and his second book, as yet untitled, will be released by Goose Lane later this year. All right, so... With uh, those introductions done, I'm now going to pass it over to Pauline, and she will begin uh, our discussion of memoir. Take it away, Pauline. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, so Jillian asked me, or asked all of us, to begin by asking how we came to want to write a memoir. And I kind of, it happened almost by mistake for me. I um, got an email uh, about this new MFA program at King's it, just before it started up and thought, that's interesting. Um, and I had recently completed uh, a radio series for news and current affairs at CBC, at CBC uh, called Rewired, which was about the cognitive, mental and emotional impact of um, digital life on children and teens. And I thought, you know, I think that would be a good book. So maybe I'll go and do this. I was also kind of interested in just learning, doing a master's and going back to learning. So off I went, I applied and got in and was all ready to um, do this rewired book. And in the first week of the program, uh, we were pitching our projects and uh, I pitched rewired. I had all the research done. I had that thing cold. And uh, then for, for some reason, I still don't fully understand. I said, can I pitch another story to you all? Uh, and everybody generously said yes. And out comes this, you know, story, crazy family story that I had only ever told a very small handful of people in my life. And so I'm telling this to 20 odd strangers in a room. And, and I, you know, as I thought about that, it may have been that it was a very warm and supportive room and, you know, kind of in the par current parlance, it was maybe felt like a safe space. Uh, and other people were talking about very personal stories as well. So that may be why suddenly I was ready to talk about it. Um, so the, the response was, yes, write that one, that family story. Uh, and it's interesting because I did go back and forth a number of times. I thought, okay, I'll write that. And then I pulled back and thought, no, I'm going back to re you know, it was really rewired was something I knew I was in my comfortable role as a journalist to do that project. Whereas writing a memoir about myself did not feel at all comfortable. Uh, so I did flip and flop a bit and then finally settled, uh, on the, um, the memoir. Um, and, you know, I was a journalist and a doc maker, documentary maker, and I'd done lots of writing, um, but I had never taken on such a big project and such a personal project. And I didn't really know where to start. Uh, so what, where I started was just writing what I remembered best. And it always seemed to be in scenes. So I would write these scenes of what I remembered. And the process of doing that helped me remember a lot of other things. And so it was in no particular order, uh, just kind of onto the page. Uh, and then I started talking to, I talked to my brother and I talked to my former sister-in-law and anybody I could think of who might remember certain parts of, of our story, but also beyond that, certain things about the time that that was all going on. Uh, and then I started doing what felt kind of normal to me. And I was interviewing experts uh, who were related to my story. So uh, mental health experts and a couple of um, really well-known psychiatrists. And I was lucky. I had quite a rich family archive, uh, which has just been helpful again and again. Uh, audio recordings, um, diaries, beginnings of diaries or journals that I had started at very various times through my life, lots of home videos um, and lots of family photographs. So I just went sort of immersed myself into 
my family's life, uh, going back to when my brother and I were first on the scene. And um, I got very lucky because um, the agent, Sean Bradley, took me on uh, and fairly early on, you know, we were pitching our projects during our residencies and uh, Diane Turbide uh, at Penguin Random House expressed an interest fairly early on at a Toronto residency. And so it was sold to Penguin Random House um, and we got into the whole editing and rewriting process, which um, was not as grueling as I thought it would be. I was prepared for a more difficult um, process. And sometimes I think maybe it should have been tougher because I, uh, it, the last time I reread, I thought, oh God, you need, you need to dead it more, but I guess nobody's ever completely happy. Um, and uh, yeah, and I was, it, it, it just feels like you're getting on some kind of a bus at that point and, you know, somebody else is driving and you're popping off to talk about this book all the time. So um, and that's where it's at now. And it's uh, there was this podcast based on the book that came out in November. Uh, and there are some other sort of side projects related to it that Jillian mentioned. So um, I keep trying to move on and I'm not there yet. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Pauline. That was great to get the uh, the story of how it came to be. Um, so we're going to we're probably going to talk a little bit more about the actual content of your story as we get into the, the Q&A session. Um, so for now, I'll go uh, move on to Sue Harper, who will tell us about uh, In the City of Light. So three weeks ago at a King's webinar, uh, Melissa Febos talked about quiet memoirs. These are memoirs that are not like Pauline's. They're not uh, centered around extreme or traumatic experiences. And um, because of that, the quiet memoirist must find their own urgency, uh, Feeble says. So Winter in the City of Light, A Search for Self and Retirement is one of those quiet memoirs. So I retired in 2006 and I was very young. I was only 54. And uh, six years later, all of a sudden, I felt totally shoved to the periphery of my own life. I'd lost my center. I'd lost my anchor. And with retirement, you know, often comes this rush of doing things we've always wanted to do, like travel, play pickleball seven days a week, or learn to speak a new language. But sometimes that rush is like the sugar high you get from eating too much dessert. It's followed by this big crash. And that's really what happened to me. My partner, Bonnie, however, was actively working toward her retirement goal of seeing just how good she could become as an artist. Because during her work life, she had owned her own art studio. She had been an art director at Canadian Tire. And then she taught art for 25 years. So in her retirement in 2013, she auditioned for and was accepted into this nine week drawing course at this prestigious art atelier in Paris. Well, I wasn't going to sit around home. So of course I tagged along. But when I returned from that nine week stay, I knew that Paris had somehow changed my life. But I was a seasoned traveler and for 18 years, Bonnie and I lived six months a year in New Zealand, but I'd never felt so compelled to write about one travel experience. So like Pauline, I was accepted into the MFA course and I thought I was just going to write something about traveling in Paris. But my mentor, Harry, amongst many others, by the way, pointed out to me that this was not commercially viable. So, hmm. so I'm pretty stubborn. And more importantly, at that part in my life, when I didn't have any control over my life, I felt I just needed to exert some control. So I just started writing stories I had found about Paris, but not about me. So January comes along and, and we were lucky enough to be in New York City for Publishers Week. And that week I suddenly realized that this book was gonna be something about retirement. And I even created this elevator pitch and here it is. 
what happens when the sugar high of retirement, that time when we think I can do anything, crashes into, oh, oh, what now? It's a great elevator pitch. However, I didn't have the book to support it. So I hadn't found a way to link any of those stories in Paris to my own experiences. And I knew I had to figure out that link. And as FIBA says, find that urgency. So second year comes along and I have a new mentor, Jane Silcott, and she helps me find more of myself in these stories. What do you know, January Publishers Week comes along and we're in Toronto. And I pitched my book to the marketing director of Penguin Random House. And he said to me, oh, you're writing a practical memoir, a kind of how to make it through retirement. And suddenly a light bulb went on and I found that urgency that Phoebus talks about. I wanted to write a book that wasn't there for me, a book about reinvention in retirement. I think it would have been really helpful if I'd come to this understanding much sooner. However, I didn't. So I knew that the structure was gonna be really complex because it wasn't just a story about my reinvention, but it was also a story about my relationship with my partner, Bonnie, with the history of Paris and with art within that reinvention. So I, I had these three really good models and I, I don't know whether anybody's read these books, but Edmund DeWall wrote, wrote a book called Hair with the Amber Eyes. And it's a story of a collection of 264 Japanese netskis that he inherited from his uncle. And the first half of the book is all about how Charles Afruzzi collected these netskis in Paris at a time when artists, particularly the Impressionists, were really influenced by everything Japanese. And he, he goes into this great detail about Paris art and society, which as a history bus, buff and an art lover, I just, I loved it. I was fascinated. But what really also intrigued, intrigued me was the way he made his research process start, start such an important part of his memoir. And I thought, oh, I, I just love that. And then another one that I read, which is also a quiet memoir, is H's for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. And her father dies, and she decides in a response to this that she is going to buy and train Mabel, who is a young goshawk. And so the major thread is her successes and failures as she trains this bird and works through her grief. But she has a second theory, which is, uh, a thread rather, which is, is the history and theory of training raptors through history. And then she has this third thread that's the exploration of the life of T.H. White, who's probably best known for the Once and, Once and Future King, but he also trained a goshawk really badly and wrote about it. And MacDonald was obsessed with his story. So then a third story that has sort of these multi layers is Jane Silcott, our very own Jane Silcott, who wrote a wonderful book called Everything Rustles, in which she talks about her everyday experiences as she approaches middle age. And two things really thread through that whole book. And one of, one of that is her humor. I just love her humor. And then the other thing is that she brought in experts um, as she reflects on her own changes in her own life. So with these three models in mind, I decided that there would be three threads running through winter in the city of light. My retirement, how I nosedived and how I tried reinventing it, the theories of retirement and our aging brains, and the stories in Paris that made me see how I could reinvent my retirement. So that's how I came to write the book. That's wonderful, Sue. Thank you. I love that the way you pulled that all together. And I also love that idea of practical memoir. Uh, so not just, you know, a, a wonderful story on its own, but also with some uh, some guidance for the rest of us who are reading. So thank you. Uh, Jason, let's turn it over to you. Thanks, Julian. So I came home from the hospital after having a psychotic episode. 
um, I was diagnosed bipolar when I was 46, which, you know, I lived a long time undiagnosed, knowing that I was having a lot of personal problems, but not really knowing what they were. Uh, like I said in the bio, like a punk rock weirdo, a freak. Like, what, why am I not meshing with people? How come I can't adjust to some of the things in, you know, outer society? And uh, came home and just kind of flopped on the couch, was completely destroyed by this psychotic episode, um, like a head injury, you know, being hit by a cinder block in the head and just kind of falling into depression for a few months. But when I first came home, I was in a manic state. So of course, at that point, everything is just wild. Um, you know, everything's running really fast and hot. And so I actually leaned over and wrote in my notebook, Scream Therapy, and I wrote podcast and book. And I didn't really know what all that meant at the time. It just had come to me in that, in that moment. Um, I started, you know, slowly getting back on my feet, uh, couldn't write. I'd spent 25 years writing about music and culture and also editing. So I was editing student newspapers and community newspapers, and I just couldn't do it. I didn't have any strength to write. I couldn't, my brain wouldn't work. I couldn't just even get a few words down on the page. Um, but I knew I wanted to do it. So I kind of left that to the side and spent, you know, a long time in depression. Some mania was coming back. I was going through the, the roller coaster of bipolar, the ups and the downs, the ups and the downs. Um, and then, you know, I started to write a little bit here and there. I wrote a couple pieces that I was, you know, okay with, uh, try to get back into the music writing and couldn't do that. Um, and eventually my wife was actually in the program, the MFA program. And I kind of saw how it worked. I saw the structure of it with the mentors and the way that it was sort of uh, set out. And I vowed never to go back to school. <laughs> I went to a journalism school for two years and I'm like, I'm never going back. Uh, I got my diploma and I was gone. I was right into the uh, writing world. Um, but I kind of saw the difference in the masters. I thought, you know what, like this, this could work. And of course, I didn't realize there was actually assignments at that point. I just thought you would just write. <laughs> but anyways, um, I did well in the end. So the book Screen Therapy is kind of piecing together my life um, my, in a sense that, you know, why was I involved with this punk scene? What was it about the punk scene that made me feel alive and like I belonged and that it made sense to me? And what did it give me? Um, and I started to look at the idea with this podcast of interviewing other folks who had also been part of the punk scene and asking them those same questions. You know, how did, how did it make them feel? What, what was their tie between punk rock and their mental health? Um, I was piecing together my life, kind of going backwards through hearing these people talking about their own experiences. And slowly I settled into this acceptance around, uh, you know, living with bipolar and what it meant and, you know, how I'd have to take medication for the rest of my life. It wasn't just, it wasn't going to get fixed. It wasn't going to go away. Um, and with that, I started to really dig into these stories of other folks who are living with mental health conditions. And at the same time, I had my own story to tell. So I, I had this story that hadn't really made sense to me until I really sat in front of the computer. I'm not a write an hour per day guy at all. Like it just does not work for me. I'm a sit down and turn the faucet on and write 3000 words in two hours and then revise the hell out of it after that. Um, that served me well. Um, and you know, the story just came pouring out, you know, as things were coming up, memories were coming up. Um, I would write something and read it the next day and say, holy shit, that happened to me. Like, <laughs> whoa, what, what? Um, so that was a really, you know, um, hard, but also really therapeutic uh, process. Um, I wrote the book in the two years in the program, had it finished, uh, got it published a year later. So I kind of was like the you know, this is how you do it kind of thing. Um, but I've always been so tight with deadlines and journalism that I was like, it has to be in this point and I have to get it out by this point. So I sort of treated the MFA um, project, the project in the same way. And it was very, you know, I really appreciated that structure with the, with the mentors. Um, you know, what I found with writing the book is that, you know, we all have a place we all have our people, we all need our people. And without that place, it's very, very hard to um, get through, you know, get through the day, get through life. And the punk scene really provides that to people. It's very inclusive, uh, despite what you might see on TV or hear about with the 
you know, the punk scene being all these rowdy, aggressive people. It's totally the opposite. Um, it's very altruistic. It's very community based. And that's what the story is about. Um, it's about me, um, first and foremost, finding my way and learning what came to the point where I was diagnosed and what came to the point where I was in a psychotic episode. And then from there, learning about how to how to find the transformation in my life and how to get, get through that and, and find my way. One of the things that really surprised me about the book is that you know, I started looking into interviewing experts, uh, mental health experts. And as I Googled, I realized, wait a second, a lot of these folks that I'm looking into actually have a punk rock background. So a lot of these psychiatrists and counselors, advocates um, lived, you know, their life was punk rock when they're growing up and to this day, even for some of them. And that was a really eye-opening moment for me because I realized that the experts were also on the team. Um, my mentor, Cooper, who is amazing, um, he he really encouraged me to get into the story because in my mind at the beginning, it was like my own memoir, uh, this literary journalism piece in the middle with, with the different folks. And then this really creative weirdo piece that I won't really talk too much about. You have to buy the book <laughs> to find that part of. Um, but initially I wasn't in the second stream, the literary journalism stream. I was really writing it, you know, third person, like I'd learned. And Cooper's like, no, no, get in there. Like you're in that part. And when, as soon as I got into that part, it was a memoir front to back memoir plus um and that made a huge difference it really made me understand the book in a, in a bigger way and i'm really happy with the way that i was able to tie those three threads together uh, fairly seamlessly i think um you know i i revise like i said before i revise the heck out of stuff and, and it probably uh you know it's a lot of time spent and i think that for me being in the program i really try to take advantage of the revising uh parts of it so i'd you know always worked really closely with my mentors to do that part of it and you know to be able to revise it's just a huge thing it was just such a great way for me to open up different scenes work on the structure um i didn't do a lot of like major overhauls but it was really like looking at it and saying hey how can i make this part better and yeah now the results i think are just so much better than what i had in mind um I mean, really, it was just that I think someone else just said, like, it sort of falls into your lap. And for me, it was like, I knew I had to do it. It was almost, it was a survival mechanism for me. You know, I had to write this book. Otherwise, it would fester inside of me for the rest of my life. And I also needed to get back to writing. Like, I just completely been you know, beaten into dust. I didn't even want to write anymore. I was like, I'll never write another word. Like, I'm not doing it anymore. Um, and, you know, it the writing and the stress and the personal stuff too was really huge in my breakdown. So I just kind of gave it up. And, you know, when I, I found the King's program, it was the jump start to get back into it. Um, I would have done it anyways, because that's just who I am. Just like I would have gone back to punk shows, you know, it was uh, going to happen. But uh, I think the other yeah, King's program really gave me that jump start. Um, yeah, and I'm published May 1st, it comes out, and I'm doing promo now, be ready to do your own promo, like, I don't know if they tell you that in the program. It's like, I'm the one that's doing all the interviews and setting it all up and booking the tour and all that. So um, that doesn't always fall on the publisher. It's great to be involved. Um, yeah, and, and thank you so much for having me and I hope people check it out. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, I love this, this kind of, uh, you know, sort of theme that's running through your discussion of both podcasts and the book of, you know, having to look outward to then look inward and and vice versa, you know, that's, that's such an important component of memoir, no matter what perspective you're coming from to kind of cast out and, and use that information to then be uh, introspective in, in your writing again. So great. Thank you. Let's go on to Ryan. Uh, Ryan. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Jillian and Kim for hosting. And thank you so much to uh, Pauline, Sue and Jason for being on the panel. I'm, I'm, I'm an esteemed company. I loved your stories and so many things, thoughts going through my mind, but I thought I would talk a little bit about the book project that I'm into right now. I, I know there's a picture of my first book there um, and I'm kind of using a similar angle with the second one, but with some, some major variations too. So um, after my first book came out, in 2018 and you know a year and a half later i was ready to start writing something else and and i'm a full-time teacher so i i don't have a lot of time to to put into writing like I, I have little chunks here and there so i thought 
okay, I'm signed up for a sabbatical. I signed up for a sabbatical that I was planning on four years in the future. So what kind of book project can I have that I can do a lot of research and reading on for a couple of years before I, I take a journey because that's, I, oh yeah, I was going to say, uh, um, when I was invited to this panel, I thought, is my book a memoir? And I thought, I don't, it doesn't feel like a memoir to me, but then I, I started researching around and thinking about all the, the people I read and I realized that it is quote unquote, a travel memoir. So, so there you go. I've got, I got my, uh, my genre out of this. So thank you. Um, and so I, I read a book called Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. And he is a Nova Scotian um, famous, depending on who you talk to, for the, the first person to sail alone around the world. He grew up on Briar Island. And after reading that book, which was a travel memoir in itself, it's a beautiful piece of writing and it really inspired me. I, um, I thought, okay, I've got this time. I, I'm gonna read as much as I can read. I, so I started reading sailing fiction, but also the sailing glossary. I know nothing about sailing, but I'm fascinated by Joshua Slocum. I started to read his biographies as well. So I read three or four biographies and came to what I think is the definitive biography. And it had the last chapter about the disappearance of Joshua Slocum. And I, I had come across that and everything else I'd read about him. So he disappeared 10 years after he wrote his book and he was about 60 years old. He sailed off on his, on his own, on the same boat. And he was trying to be the first person to sail down the Amazon river. Um, but he disappeared in the Caribbean and, and this is, this is in 1909. So there was no way anyone knew where he was. And, uh, no one found out for about six months and his death and his disappearance remains a mystery to this day. There's no real factual evidence. And being a, you know, I'm not, I'm not a journalist. So I, I knew I wasn't going to get to the bottom of this story in a factual way, but I thought maybe I could come at it from a more spiritual angle. Um, so getting inside his head and tying that around a, an actual journey. So I thought, okay, my sabbatical is coming up and this is September of 20 of 2021. So just recently, and um, I'm going to try to cycle from my home in Cow Bay, Nova Scotia, all the way to Briar Island. So down along the South shore, uh, up the French shore, and then down the Digby neck and take three and a half weeks to do that and camp and surf and sort of live rough, but also to learn about the place, talk to people and, and try to channel the spirit of Joshua Slocum um, and bring his book along with me. So I, I, um, I got to do that. I got to go on a journey and I, I took to, to kind of get my writing muscles going the, the summer I wrote a lot, just whatever came to my mind. I was writing lightly through the school year. And then, but then in the summer I went into a boot camp, just writing, writing, writing. And then on the journey, I took a lot of notes, a lot of narrative. Anytime I had some time, uh, downtime, I would be writing. So then when I came back to here, then I got to try out this, this amazing role. It's called full-time writer. Um, it's not something that I think I'll ever be able to do for at least the next couple of decades. So I thought I got this chance to be a full-time writer. I can go down to my, my desk and write for four hours. And like that is, was unheard of. So I'm going to take this opportunity and do it. And I'll set myself a goal to try to write this thing in, in three months. So I got back, I planned it out. Um, I planned out the chapters and kind of the way that uh, drop name dropping Ken McGugan, he, he really uh, helped me on my first one on structure. And I know he's kind of legendary about that. And, and he remains my, my guru now. So I had him sort of silently telling me or giving me advice on my structure. I had the structure down and then, and then I went, went to it and um, I wrote it in longhand, which was something I wanted to mention too, which was, I wrote the first, first one uh, typing it up and I thought, well, I'll try writing longhand because why not see how it goes. And um, it, it was a different experience. I, I, I liked it, but um, it, it made things portable so I could move things. I didn't have to be around a computer. I could go out to, to the backyard or write in different places. So anyway, I got it written up and then um, the, our next, our family plan was to go traveling. Oh, nice cat. It was to go traveling with the, the girls. So pull the girls out of school and um, travel around the world a little bit. We went to Sri Lanka. So we went to Sri Lanka in the, the new year and I had my, my writing, my, my handwritten manuscript in my bag and I brought it there and uh, it took me six weeks to type it up. And then once I was done typing it up, I realized, okay, all my MFA training came back and there was voices again, write a proposal. So that's what we do in the first year as, as everyone who's taking the program 
And now I, I, I understood why we did it the first year. And now the value of it is even, even greater. So I took the time to write a decent, solid um, proposal. And then I sent that off at the beginning of April uh, of this of this year or of uh, 2022. And um, I kind of sent it off. And here's another thing I realized. I thought I'll go for a moonshot publisher. In my case, it was uh, Patagonia Books. Um, I didn't think it would fit their list at all, but I sent it anyway, almost trying to get a nice rejection, which I did get. Uh, so I, I got myself a rejection, but I also sent it to Goose Lane, which was my number one um, idea for a publisher. And I wanted, really wanted to work with them. So then it was, it was three months of radio silence and I really held off on sending a follow-up because as you, as you read everywhere, it's, you know, six to eight months and glacial pace, et cetera. So I thought, okay, but I, and I was literally, I almost had the email written up as a follow-up and I finally, I heard back and it was interesting. And what I think is also interesting is that it was not a, you know, okay, great idea. Let's go for it. It was, we like your proposal, but there's, there's a lot about it. We don't, we have questions about and that kind of threw me for a loop. It was almost like a, it was like a bad date. I was on, I was on a meeting and I thought, do they even like this? Uh, but they gave me a shot to revamp my proposal. So I spent all like a number of weeks, uh, mostly a month um, re revamping my proposal and I resent it. And then by uh, Thanksgiving, that's when, that's when I got the book offer. So that was kind of cool that they gave me that shot to show them I'm ready to hustle. I'm ready to kind of move move in their direction somewhat, and um, and so now I'm in the revision process, and I've just rewritten the first chapter and gotten some feedback on that. So some big big changes are, are happening, and everything feels like it's kind of falling down, but also I'm starting to see more of the essence that was there. So I'm I'm deep in the revision trenches now, um, and then oh yeah. Hope to publish by spring 2024. That's kind of when I'm slotted in. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, nice to hear um, someone talking from being in the moment <laughs> of doing it rather than kind of retrospectively. So, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm excited uh, to read it. So um, maybe I'll toss out a question to everybody on the panel and, and just jump in as you as you wish to respond. Um, let's first talk about that balance that's required between remembering and telling your own story and then bringing in other elements that often you have to research. Um, how did you strike that balance? How did you decide where to go and what to research and then how to integrate the data uh, that you gathered when it came time to putting the story down on paper? I'll go. Yeah. For me, it was all learning exercise. I didn't know much about, honestly, I'd never heard the word bipolar before I was diagnosed. I knew it was used as a slur sometimes, but I never knew what it actually meant. So for me, it was like from the ground up, I was learning about, you know, what my life looked like before, and then also learning about mental health and um, different conditions. I mean, my book was um, hoping to encapsulate uh, mental health in general as, as but through, the, through the lens of, a, of the punk scene. Um, yeah, so it wasn't so much like, trying to figure out where it was going to go until I had it all. And then it was like a, it was just like a learning exercise from the ground up. And in some ways that was really helpful. It, it allowed the story to breathe a lot more. And it also allowed the book to develop in an interesting way. It wasn't just like, here's what I know. Boom, boom, boom. It was more like, here's what I'm learning. And here's what this person's learning from me. And it was that whole process that uh, drove the book. So that's how it worked for mine. Yeah, that's that's really interesting and and a nice journey for your reader too because they're just kind of following along with you. Yeah, anyone else want to speak to that question? How did you bring in materials, Sue? See your hand up. Um, my first degree was in psychology, so I am quite interested in the human condition, the human brain. Um, but I realized as I was kind of going through the writing process that really my big problem in retirement is that I'm a type A personality and type A's don't retire well. And uh, so I thought, okay, let's focus on people who have talked about type A personalities. That's kind of where I started. A lot of retirement literature is on male retirees because traditionally male have, males have had a harder time 
retiring than females. So there wasn't a lot out there for um, females. So I went through a lot of the male um, literature and thought, well, this applies perfectly to females. Why is this not the same? Or why are we not writing about women? So I, I really just tried to pick as many resources as, as I felt uh, places went wrong in my life, you know, as I was retired or when I was retired, I started looking for the people who were experts on that aspect of it, whether it was I couldn't sit still or whether it was I had these overwhelming fears of getting lost or being unattached, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, I just started looking for experts and then trying to build them in. And I think Pauline said, she wishes she had had time to edit after the book was finished. I would edit a few of those out or maybe shorten them a bit, but I'm kind of pleased with the way it worked out. Um, so I, it's really interesting. I, part of my discomfort with writing the memoir is that I did not want to write sort of a trauma tale. Um, and so initially, as I was writing it, I decided this was going to be something I wrote for my family, uh, mostly for my kids, uh, who really loved their grandmother, who was, you know, a major part of the story. And I really wanted them um, to know about what had happened in kind of a, a more nuanced way. Um, I did not want them to judge her. Um, and it was actually, and, and I, there was a, a certain question within my story that had always troubled me. I couldn't understand why um, somebody had come along and deceived the family. And uh, so at some point when I was doing some research, I discovered why. I discovered what I believe to be the reason, um, which was a kind of a rare condition called delusional disorder. I don't know if it's really as rare as the as the literature suggests, but because um, I've sure heard from people all over the world about it. Um, and that was, for me, when it was worth publishing because there was something I felt compelled to tell people about. Um, and that is that this thing that is unrecognizable to most people can have such an outsized impact on the lives of people. Um, and so that's when the research part came in. So, and, and it became really important. Um, so, you know, that you tell the story, but then you start to fit in um, some of the explanation and some of the, the research. So that became really important for me. Uh, it, just to echo on, on Jason's point there, I think that idea of uh, searching for something and, and that energy of, and curiosity and, and obsession, and in my case, was a bit more external and trying to find out more about Joshua Slocum and to become uh, like the foremost sailing scholar who has never sailed before. That's kind of where I'm coming at this. And hopefully people would be interested in it but i'm i'm banking on my curiosity being interesting enough that other people can come with me and be curious with me and so mine like i was thinking it's maybe not as self-reflective there are points in it that where i talk about my teaching career and how it's how i'm you know i'm kind of at a crossroads but um I, I thought about this term it's a bit uh a bit of a mouthful but self self-refraction rather than self-reflection so i'm kind of a I'm standing in between the reader and, and the scene or the place and trying to bend the light a little bit to illuminate new things where it's not so much about me, but I'm, I'm there trying to trying to show how beautiful the South Shore is and and surfing and sailing and and this interesting guy, Joshua Slocum. So to do that, I had to read, read a lot of um, sailing books. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing that you mentioned, Ryan, because, you know, so much of the research that a writer does, whether it's for memoir or another kind of nonfiction book or even fiction, so much of that just sits in us and imbues our writing, but doesn't necessarily come out uh, in the form of data, statistics, you know, quotes from experts, that sort of thing, but can really just infuse what you're putting down on the page. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of curious now, Ryan, you know, we left off with you and and you're sort of in the moment, you know, this this book that you're writing now is is um you know uh, of a recent experience and you had the mm -hmm. benefit of knowing you were writing and collecting material along the way but often memoirs about um memory right and and going back quite far in time to tell your story and 
uh, often our memories fail us. And so I'm curious uh, as to the role that memory played for all of you when you were writing your stories and how that came up against perhaps other people's recollections of similar events and important moments in your life and, and how you kind of reconciled that in the writing process. Jason, yeah. Um, so I didn't really have any... I didn't have many memories of growing up. Um, in fact, I didn't have many memories of being an adult. So when the mania gets to a certain point, often it's like a blackout, um, not the standard blackout you see when someone's just like completely um, can't remember the next day, but a lot of details get fuzzed out. And so I found that when I started writing, these truths and memories were coming, but I didn't really know them until I read them back uh, in, in that amount of detail. So what I did is I didn't show anybody any of my memoir memoir stuff. Like no one's seen it except for the folks that have read an advanced copy, a reviewer or somebody. Nobody in the book has seen anything that involves them. Risky, <laughs> potentially problematic, uh, potentially disastrous. Um, the reason I did that is because I didn't want anybody else to come along and say, oh, no, that's not the way it happened, because these memories are coming out of some deep place. And so they happened. Um, checking facts here and there, of course, you know, what year was I doing this thing or but as far as the actual context of the memories, I, they're my memories and I'm going to hold them close to me and the readers are going to read them and the people that are in the stories are going to read them and, and they're going to have to deal with it. Um, I don't know what the other option really is um, when I'm talking about these kinds of really um, uh, difficult subjects. Not to say anybody in the book is painted as any kind of a villain. That's not the case. Um, there are some people in there that aren't named that are villainous in my story, especially my early childhood. But none of the family members are like, it's not, they're not being painted as, as bad people. It's just like, in fact, they're being painted as very loving and supportive but I don't want them coming along and saying, oh, well, no, you weren't, you know, you weren't depressed for five months. You're actually depressed for, you know, nine months. Like, that's not what I'm interested in doing. <laughs> yeah. I had um, very few people to sort of say, is this what you remember? My brother's younger than me and he didn't remember a lot of things that I did. And you know, the, all of the main characters were gone, they were dead. Um, and I thought so much about uh, what Lori Nielsen Glenn had talked about during the MFA about memory. Um, and so I did everything I could to to sort of make sure that, that I was on track, that I wasn't making stuff up. Uh, but in the end, I had to just say, this is what I remember. And what what more can you do? And, you know, often um, you think, well, my memory may not be exact, but it's true to the flavor of the thing, you know, uh, and you hope that it's it's at least true in some way, even if you messed up some of the details. Um. Go ahead like um yeah uh i kept a journal the whole time i was in paris and um that book actually extends over three different visits uh, 2013 2014 and 2016 and i kept daily journals the whole time <clears throat> in 2013 i had no idea i was going to write this but um i just kept a journal anyway because i thought it was interesting so luckily i have some pretty clear memories about those times because of the journal, including like what the weather was like, boring things like that. But I will say that I mentioned my brother and sister both in my book and both of them said, we don't remember that happening that way. So kind of like Pauline, it's like, well, that's the way I remember it. So, you know, it, it wasn't so important that, um, you know, they were going to sue me or anything, but, um, you know, it was funny that my memory is so different than their memories, and that, that happens. I get it. I, I have a few, a, a number of flashbacks in the book that are, uh, I guess, relatively benign in terms of 
other people who would check me out. But I was thinking as I was listening to everyone talking that uh, the, the, the gamble or the risk that I'm taking, I think, with this one is that I'm trying to be more honest about some of the experiences I had on the road. And they're not they don't all square with being a, a, a responsible school teacher. And I know my high school students will read this. Their parents will read this, maybe, if I'm lucky. <laughs> and it might be one of these like, hey, Mr. Shaw, chapter eight. Uh, uh, but I, I want... I think I, I think I took the edges off on the first one, but this time I want to, I want to step out there and be more honest. And, um, and, and then the one other thing is that there was, there, there was a, the second or third last chapter, really important chapter in the book. And, and it profiles a person I met and I, it was nagging at me. So I, I, uh, printed off, uh, printed it off, the chapter off and I, I posted it to him cause I had gotten his address. Um, and I asked for his permission and I, I just crossed my fingers and um, I thought this could go in any any kind of way. I, I was prepared to cut it and see what would be left, but it would maybe be taking the heart out of the book. So uh, I took that gamble as well. And and he got back to me with this really short email like, yeah, great. Go for it. <laughs> so I was like, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And again, you've kind of launched us into our, our next question, which now I, I sort of want to make a two pronged question for all of you, which is how do you think about your vulnerability on the page and making your story, not just a series of say diary entries where you recount what happened, but you actually get to the emotional heart of yourself and the story you're trying to tell without also kind of compromising yourself or get or putting pieces of you into the world that perhaps are a little more uncomfortable or or things that you know might be difficult to deal with down the road and sort of parallel to that my other question was how do you represent other people who are very close to you who are spouses friends family colleagues you know um how do you grapple with the the sort of ethical dilemmas of representing them on the page? Do you have particular craft ways of dealing with that? Did you have certain approaches you took to the people in your lives? Um, that sort of thing. Jason, yeah. I also keep the same pattern here. <laughs> um, so part two of the question, what I did kind of unknowingly is I gave each character in the book a certain role. So for instance, my mom played the role of um, a person who had to work very hard to support her and I, um, but had you know some compromises there as far as you know me being left alone sometimes. And so she was that role. And then of course, you know, over here I've got uh, my wife who was the, you know, the one that was the rock for me, that role. I gave each character a role. I had a, a person who was very influential to me in it and introduced me to the punk scene. We were skateboarding, just met this, this guy. He's like, here, check, check out these punk bands on this tape. So that person was, you know, kind of the guru or the, or the mentor that made me um, fairly clear on who those characters would be throughout. And then I was able to kind of set myself in the middle and let them uh, be those characters without me having to deviate and, and be worried about them um you know being upset or or whatever um you know I, th I think as far as vulnerability I don't know when I came out of the hospital I was on the rooftops just saying bipolar I'm bipolar I live with bipolar this is what bipolar is like I mean it was I was never really feeling um scared to talk about it and I think when I was writing I was just like you know what like this is really for me um I'm going to write this so that I can cope and, and make sense of it but if it's going to help somebody else out then that's great and so I have to be very honest you don't have to explain what this actually looks like you know what does it look like when you're living in a manic state or depressive episode and what does it look like when you have trauma from your, your childhood and how does that affect your mental health going forward like I really wanted to explain all those things um, that was all those secondary like primary for me was really just being vulnerable and just kind of sitting with myself and feeling like I belong to my own skin after so many years of feeling like I didn't. Anyone else? So um, I think the interesting thing about me writing was that I couldn't be vulnerable. I, 
I couldn't let myself be vulnerable. And it was, it, I was on the course and it was Jane Silcott who, um, who just said, you need to be more you, you need to be, you know, you need to expose yourself more. You need to dig down into your own life much more. And interestingly, reactions when people read my book is, oh, you've just, you've been so vulnerable. You've just exposed yourself so much. So I guess Jane did a really, really good job, um, which was great. And it, also it's really interesting when people read your book, especially people you don't know at all, they'll, they'll find something in that the you never noticed. I mean, we all know this when we're reading books, right? But this woman said, your book is all about death. I thought, oh, I guess there is a lot of death in there. And I hadn't really thought about it. But about, about other people, <clears throat> there is one section, small, very small section in there. And our daughter um, tried to commit suicide when she was 17 years old. And I really felt that I needed to include that in this little section when we were going to see Jim Morrison's grave in, in uh, the cemetery. Um, and it was really important to me because her coming out of that and surviving that and being a stronger person because of it was a lesson to me as a retired person. So, uh, but I did ask her permission to, um, to include it. But I know Bonnie was very uncomfortable at first when I was going to include that. And she, she, she was more nervous about it than I was. But when I asked Bonnie, I mean, Darcy, she said, fine. Now, the other thing is, Bonnie thinks that I villainized her through the entire book. Um, so, but she did read every word and she didn't change anything. So it's okay. But I also had one woman in my book and I was not going to change any names. And, uh, but she was a child um, during the Nazi occupation of Paris and her parents moved her uh, whole family to a small village to um, escape from the Nazi, um, it, the Nazis in Paris. And um, she told me this story that there were these stores that they had all of this used clothing. And she saw these shoes that she just loved. And she went in and she convinced her mother to buy them. And they were actually too small for her. She was a very young girl. She didn't realize that all of these clothes were from um, people that they had shipped off to concentration camps. And it was only as an adult that she realized this. But I don't think that Mrs. Chancereau would ever read my book, but I thought this is a very sensitive story and it's not really my story to tell. So I did change her initials. I, I never called her by her full name anyway. But I did change her initials just to protect that. Um, I didn't really want to call her up in France and, and ask her if I could include it. So I just made sure that she wasn't recognizable. Um, I, in, I was kind of lucky in that a lot of the time I was writing, I was only writing for myself and my family. And so I did truly write you know, they say, write like no one's going to read it. And I, I really did. Um, but ultimately, when it became apparent that there might be a, another audience for it, um, I said to my brother, you know, this is your story, too. And, um, you know, I'd like you to read it. And I'd like to know what you think. And he said, Nope, I'm not reading it. I, you know, he was he was incredibly generous with me and said, I'm sure it'll be great. Um, so yeah, I just, um, I think I think both of those things were so amazingly helpful uh, in being able to care less about what people thought. When I did go to publish it, I thought, oh, people are going to go, how could you have been so stupid? Only the Americans asked me that, though, interestingly. <laughs> Sorry, Pauline, I want to interject with why stupid? What what? what? <laughs> Why did you expect that question? <laughs> well, it was, you know, it's the story of uh, somebody with delusional disorder who sort of has this big impact on our lives. And we end up moving all over the country and sort of um, hiding out and so on. Um, and and when I was finally told what was going, what, what he thought was going on, what my mother thought was going on, um, you know, I think if you hadn't, 
sort of lived that and been primed for the idea that something really outrageous was going on, you might have said, are you crazy? And I, I didn't initially say that. Yeah, I was never sure one way or the other, but I, I went along with it for a while. Yeah. Ryan, did you want to jump in at all? Well, I think I, I think I might have kind of hit it at the end of my last one, but I, I was, um, I think when, uh, when Sue brought up death there, I, I was also going to bring up death, interestingly enough, because that's something that that I'm meditating on in this story. In some ways, to get to Joshua Slocum or to get to the other side, to to, to waltz with death in a way. So I've uh, I think I I where I'm being trying to be vulnerable or feel like I might be is my my thinking around death and thinking about my own family and you know the fear of it, but also trying to put the trying to um dissolve the fear of it in a way so so maybe that's that's one of the vulnerabilities that i that i really wanted to push as much as i could without being without being boring and long-winded so hopefully hopefully that worked well it's a compelling subject to be sure <laughs> so i'm sure it did yeah, we have some questions from our attendees um, that I'd like to put out to the panel. Uh, the first one, and, and I'll invite our other attendees, if you have a question that's uh, on your mind, feel free to add it into the, the Q&A section here. Um, so the first question is, does everyone think uh, that the proposal is essential and how is an elevator speech different from the proposal? Um, so maybe I'll pass that off to the panelists and, and I'll add uh, afterwards if there's anything else to add to that. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Just say just say one one quick answer to that. I think it is it is uh, essential, and from from publishers I've spoken to, in, in both both my books, uh, that was one of the first points. Like, wow, that was a professional proposal. It's uh, and I, I don't have an agent, so it's not to say it gets you in the door, but if it lands on someone's desk and it looks pro, and you show that you've put the time in and you understand your project and you. And you're you're almost like stepping into their marketing meeting and saying, "Hey, got everyone, listen up. This this I think this could sell." So I do think it's essential to have a, a really solid proposal. I the short answer is yes. The proposal I think is essential, and I think being unagented as well. Um, uh, our uh, my next book was is co-authored by another person uh, in the MFA course and. Our proposal, we 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 tailored it to this particular uh, publisher, and unlike um, most of our experiences, uh, it, we we heard back within two days from that publisher who said, "We love your idea. We want your book." And it was the proposal because we had it was a good proposal right along the MFA line, and but also really tailored to. Um, to that particular publisher. I uh, I knew I wanted to do a, uh, my book with an independent publisher sort of from the very beginning. And <laughs> imagine my surprise when the person that I sent it to that actually wanted to buy the book uh, didn't want a proposal. <laughs> After all those hundreds of hours I spent on the proposal over the last two, two years. However, um, there's so many things that are in the proposal that I was able to use for different aspects of uh, the book promotion. And of course, you know, a lot of the queries did want a proposal, the majority did. So I was able to send those out. Uh, but yeah, I guess thinking about it as a document that's going to necessarily get you a book contract uh, in my mind wasn't uh, accurate, but what it was is it put all my, my thoughts together and gave me you know, here's the part about my marketing that I'm going to send to the marketing people. Here's my part about my bio. Here's, and all the pieces were there. And they also allowed me to uh, write more material. So I had those things in front of me, and chap little chapter sections, proposed chapter sections. Um, so it was a very useful document. Um, ultimately, in my case, it didn't actually apply to the, the contract. But yeah, I def definitely say it's very important, um, especially for for having those materials in front of you. Yeah, my experience was the same as yours, Jason. I I don't know whether my publisher read my book proposal, but um, not that I'm aware of, but uh, the, the work that you put into it uh, is really preparing you for all kinds of different parts of the process, I would say. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I would just add to that, that the distinction between the um, proposal and the elevator pitch is that the proposal is often maybe a 20 to 30 page document. It includes, you know, an overview of the book, an overview of each chapter, um, your marketed competition. So parallel books that are like yours, um, your publicity and marketing plan, but also a, a an excerpt of the book itself. And so when it does go out to a publisher, they have a real strong sense of the what the whole book is going to look like. And, and so it's a very comprehensive document that, as everyone has said, will play into the sort of different pieces of the writing and publishing process for you as an author, whereas the elevator pitch is what we all know the elevator pitch to be, a distillation of the idea of the book into kind of two or three pithy sentences that can also be quite useful, you know, when you just happen upon somebody who expresses interest in your book to be able to say, it is this, you know, is, is a very powerful uh, tool to have in hand as well. Um, but generally, that's not enough to get the attention of either an agent or a publisher. You do need to have something much more fully fleshed out. Yeah. We have another question. Um, it says, uh, I heard recently that um, it's an enormous time killer to go back to your journals and sift through them to refresh memories and find your stories. And so it's sort of been recommended to not do that. So uh, this uh, uh, participant is asking what the experience was like of the panelists. What do you think about going back to your journals and mining them for memories? Uh, well, first of all, I don't know who said that, but I, I don't know that it's true. Um, in my case, I didn't have anything to mine. Um, I was able to get some childhood photos that I could look at. I didn't have any journals. I had nothing. I mean, I could look back on my music writing and pull things here and there. In fact, the term screen therapy was in a lot of my music articles over the years, which is kind of kind of telling. Um, yeah, I just didn't have a lot to go with. And I opened up the faucet and it it was there um, in my memory. But uh, you know, I, I didn't keep a lot of stuff. Uh, and I didn't really, my writing was always just like, boom, 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 send it off to the editor, gone. Uh, it wasn't like diaries or journals or uh, I wasn't writing a memoir at all. I was always writing uh, journalism articles. So didn't have a lot to, to work with. Thoughts from anyone else? Did any of you, I think a couple of you mentioned that you turned back to journals, but I guess the distinction is whether you were consciously keeping a journal with a view to writing a book versus turning back to something that you'd happened to written and provided material for you down the road. Yeah, Sue? I I, I did, as I said, I did keep a journal. Um, and it's good to see what events happened in what order. So, and I did go back to them. But a lot of the times I went back because I had written descriptions about things that I really liked. Like one was a description of the carillon that I could hear every morning. Um, and so those kinds of things were great because then I could, I, could, I could remember those. But my journals also include photos. I had thousands and thousands of photos. And, um, and I include the, I mean, I include those in my mind in, in, as part of a journal. And I think without those photos, I, I couldn't have recreated some of the scenes that I, I was able to do. Yeah, I, I, I guess it might depend partly on how prolific a journal writer, writer you are, you know, how much there is to go through. I, my journals were never, you know, that whole you know big um but i did find the odd entry really helpful for helping me put things in the order that they happened you know that's a thing in your childhood right where you don't know you know that time we went camping was that before or after this other time so that it was helpful for timelines for me yeah i would just say going forward anyone who's thinking about that um you know, sometimes even just the smallest things can trigger a memory and put you back in a space, right, which can be very evocative for writing about, you know, smells and tastes and, and feelings and, and things that were going on. And so I use this now, it's just called Some Lines a Day, and it's a five-year journal, but you open it up and you know, it's, oh, there it is, my first vaccine dose happened, <laughs> right? But I, all I have written is that day that it happened. But I very distinctly remember being in the car, you know, the high five I gave my partner afterwards, this feeling of excitement and freedom. So something even as small as that can can really help you trigger memories. And, and so maybe less so um, the, the, the actual events are less important 
than the feelings and the mindset that going back to those journals generates, right? And, and can put you in the, the proper space for writing uh, some of that material. Yeah, uh, we have another question. Um, but, uh, and it says this, I would like to ask the panelists, why would I want to read your memoir or who would want to read your memoir? And this attendee is asking this because uh, they are wondering themselves who would want to read their <laughs> memoir and yet they want to write it. Um, I think that's such a, an important question. And yeah, it's something we all have to think about if we're approaching uh, writing memoir. So any thoughts on that question? Pauline, yeah. What? I struggled with that so much. Um, and I think the real key to making your memoir worth reading uh, by somebody else is, can you find the universal in your story? Uh, can you, and that's what will make it more interesting to other people. Uh, so for me, it was, it was learning, you know, about this under recognized condition and being able to share that, that I thought made it worthwhile. I think that's the key is, you know, how does your experience, what, what value can your experience be to other people through your thoughtful kind of picking through it? Yeah. Um, so I guess one of the ways that I look at it is if, you can show somebody um, a scene um, and try to have them inquisitive about it and wonder, well, why is that? So for instance, you know, there's a mosh pit and people are flying around and they're, you know, banging off of each other and then someone falls down and the whole mosh pit stops because they need to pick this person back up, you know, whereas people would think, oh, well, they just keep going and stop on this person because they're wild. And someone was looking at that and wonder, well, why is that, you know, or why was um, I able to, uh, put music on when I was feeling like I was going to kill somebody because I was in a psychotic state. Why did the music make me calm, even though the music is wild and chaotic and loud and screamy? Um, so like if someone was looking at those scenes and thinking, okay, well, why? Then I think that's a good way to to find out who your, your reader is. And I guess the idea is that, you know, most people would say why, you know, most people would want to find out. Um, rather than me saying, oh, well, I'm writing my book for this person or this person, uh, you know, a certain group or whatever. I want to write it for the person that's curious about my story or the things that I'm showing them in the book. Anyone else? Big question. Yeah, that's, right. a, that's a big one. And I think uh, I, I'm hoping that that people who want to learn more about Nova, Nova Scotia for one uh, in particular it's a, it's a regional book in a way um, so the the beauty the landscape and the people of the south shore of Nova Scotia and the Acadian shore so I think maybe an armchair travel uh, enthusiast or someone who might also want to or is considering an adventure of their own maybe uh, something something similar where you step out of your your life to go experience something and and see what what happens from it so and then also uh, anybody into sailing and surfing. So it's pretty narrow in there as my as my like real target target audience. But then at un, under the undercurrent is I, I hope that I hope that it's good enough that it hangs around and that people pass it around. So if you give it a try, you're going to want to read it and read the whole thing and hopefully pass it to someone else. So that's that's who I'm looking for. I don't know who that's going to be, but hopefully. Mine is obviously written for retirees, but I also think that it's written for people who love to travel, especially anyone who likes to travel to Paris, because there are a ton of Paris stories in it. Um, Leslie Buxton, who I, I've written the next three books with, she always says people who are 50 should read this book because then they'll know what they're going to come up against in the future. Um, I also think it's a really, uh, I hate this, this is so sexist. I really think it is a book for women um, because there is not a lot written for women about retiring. So um, yeah, I think that's who my audience is. You know, I, I think I'd add to all of your answers that the key thing to remember is um, we do genuinely have 
some curiosity about other people's stories. And, uh, and that should be the driving force of you wanting to write your memoir, that somebody else out there will want to know about you just because we want to know about other people. But a good way to think about it is think about the memoirs you've read and the reasons you liked those memoirs, what kept you going through those stories. Often it's not some kind of, you know, exciting, thrilling experience that the author had, but it's this kind of ability to tap into something we all feel or we all can identify with or to open the space for you as the reader to kind of map their lives or their emotional experiences onto. Um, so there's there are many reasons, but sometimes turning to those things that are inspiring can really help you solidify your reasons for writing your memoir. Um, I, I'd encourage uh, questions. We have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, if anyone else has a question, please feel free to type it into the q and I'll ask our panelists uh, a couple more. Um, while we're waiting. Uh, one is just tell us about the process about uh, 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 being on the publicity circuit, because I think that's something people are very curious about. And you mentioned it briefly, Jason, as you know, bringing in pieces of your proposal into how you're now working uh, through the marketing uh, component of publishing your book. Um, but what was that publicity experience like for all of you, especially when it comes to actually talking about your own story? Uh, I'm just in the early stages. Um, I've done that kind of stuff through my life, but as far as for the book, and, you know, it's, it's, I'm a hustler. I'm like a spreadsheet person. Like, you know, here's all the university radio stations in the world. And here's all the, you know, podcasts that have to do with mental health. And there's a gazillion. And then I just go after them one by one. So that's kind of my style. Um, as far as, um, you know, you get some interesting hits. Like I just got onto a podcast uh, recently um, that was about um, basically like being a parent uh, with for, for children who have mental health conditions. And the angle I took was, you know, you know, uh, punk rock and getting into these scenes and being included in these these subcultures can be really valuable for young folks. And that was my kind of angle. So, you know, not just looking at what I think is kind of the obvious stuff. Um, it's a lot of work. It you have to get up for it. You have to be ready uh, for each individual, whether it's an article they're writing or or a podcast interview. So it is it is tough sometimes to kind of be in that space all the time. Uh, but I think, you know, if you're comfortable talking about your book and it, you know, we all are on this this panel, and I know a lot of people are. Sometimes it's just a question of taking a breath and just letting it out and not trying to do over prepare. Um, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it is a, it is a train, a publicity train. And, and I've learned that I, you know, have to do a lot of that myself. Um, I found that it, I got better at doing that stuff over time. The first publicity thing I had to do was this big luncheon at the King Edward hotel in Toronto. <laughs> and I, it was like, you know, the hoi polloi of the literature and art scene. And, it was a really intimidating crowd. And, and then we all had to sign afterwards. And my uh, editor came over and said, no, 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 you talked about the wrong things. <laughs> um, so, you know, there is a learning process to knowing what are the things that people want to hear about your book and what should you just leave it to them to discover in your book. Um, but it's, and, and then, you know, I did a, a, what they call a radio tour where I, you know, sat in my office and took all these phone calls uh, from radio stations uh, in the States. And you can tell that nobody's read the book. One person had read the book and they've got all these crazy ideas about your book that aren't even true. So that you're spending half your time kind of redirecting people and, and trying to sort out some of the details. Um, so I, I, I don't know what to, you should take from all of that, except you have to be pretty nimble, I guess. <laughs> and yeah, just to jump in there, I think Eleanor Wachtel has read your read a book. Like you, when you hear her talking to the the author, the author knows that she's read the whole book or maybe multiple books, which is really nice. Um, but on, on the publicity, just one little sliver, a side side note, I guess, is looking for blurbs and looking for people to uh, to try to say something nice about your book, which is where I'm heading into now. And um, and so I've, I've got this idea where I'd like to, th there's this big fish guy I wanna get to blurb my book. His name is William Finnegan. He wrote Barbarian Days, kind of like the 
these the surfing book but i don't know how to find him so i'm actually going to try to i'm going to take a little trip down to new york city to do some editing and revision that's the idea of it on my march march break but i'm also going to try to find william finnegan so i know that i probably won't find him but i'll end up with an interesting story along the way that i could write up so maybe in the on the publicity side of things or through the whole process keep keep looking for little essays as you go along or stories and, and keep your notes going because then ho hopefully maybe something could come out of it that even if I don't meet him, I could have something published and coming out a month or two before my book. So I don't know, I'm always looking for, for ways to, to get the name out there. And it's not always uh, something I can plan. I um I think I am the only self-publisher sub self-published um, writer of a memoir here on this panel, and I will be the first to admit that I am a the worst marketer in the world, and I'm not very good with publicity. But um, readings I've done a lot of readings with other people, um, and and that that's been a a great way. I did a reading two weeks ago where I. I, it was actually someone else's book launch, but she asked two other readers to read with her. And I ended up selling more books than I've sold in ages at that book launch that wasn't even my own. Um, I also have tried to get um, uh, not parts of my book, but I think you just said um, like articles published through uh, websites where then you can say, and she's also written a book about blah, blah, blah and hoping that that people will will pick that up um not having a publisher for my memoir i i will say having a publisher for our second sets of books you it is much easier <laughs> i've been on little tours at museums and things like that this one has been much harder and i and i did two book launches myself one in new zealand and one in one here in canada and they were both very successful and sold lots of books. Um, but after that, a COVID came and then I really lost a lot of my sort of get up and go. It got up and went. So I, I should start back at it. I keep saying that, um, but who knows whether I actually will. Julian, can I just jump back in on that? Uh, because I realize um, I should mention book clubs. Um, I have been a guest at dozens of book clubs and they are such great um, platforms to to connect around your your work. And when a book club reads your book, they all go out and buy your book, which is a nice thing. Um, and they tell their friends and they are on social media and all those kinds of things. But also I have book club envy from some of the fantastic book clubs I've uh, visited. It's great to sort of, and then you can sort of be practicing how you're talking about your work too, if you need to do that in a book club. <laughs> yeah, they're they're quite forgiving spaces and and so enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, uh, just um, oh yeah. Sorry, Jillian. Yeah. Just something came to me about the previous question about who would want to read my memoir. And there's nothing really wrong with saying, people that like good writing like you, sometimes people say what kind of movies do you like well I like good movies so it doesn't have to be a specific audience it could just be someone that really enjoys the craft of writing really enjoys wordplay and all those things um, there's a universal audience out there that just like good books yes that's very important to keep in mind you know sometimes the best thing you have that sells a book is good writing right more than the actual story yeah um, Pauline, someone mentioned here in the comments that uh, they heard you on CBC uh, uh, talking about your book, and they were so riveted by your interview that they went and got a copy at the first opportunity. So there you go. <laughs> Publicity works. <laughs> yeah. So but there's one final question from uh, uh, an attendee that I'll put out to all of you and, and sort of combine that with one I had uh, lingering for our last question, which is... Um, they say uh, they're not a writer, uh, but they would like to write their memoirs. Uh, and where do they start? And, and I guess, yeah, generally, I'd like to ask all of you, what are your tips for those in our crowd here who are interested in getting their memoirs going, whether they have writing experience in the past or not? Yeah. 
I would just say put on your favorite album on your headphones and just let it come out. Uh, I don't think you can plan writing a memoir very much. You could do some sort of an outline, but really it's in there and it just needs to somehow come out. And so it's, in my mind, it was quite simple. I just sat in front of the computer and, okay, here we go. What's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know. And then I got what I got. Yeah, I I found it was writing the things that seemed biggest or most important or most impactful as and and scenes, you know, where you can actually write a scene of something happening uh, was a, a kind of an organizing principle for me. I didn't realize that's what I was doing at the time. I was just flailing around trying to write something. Uh, but that looking back, that's really what helped me the most. Um, I'll just say my my father-in-law is starting to to write stories about his childhood and and um, what helps him I think is is a captive audience it, it, grandchildren or others who so he's writing these stories and then reading them aloud to us and then we all want more and so he's he's finding he's writing in the middle of the night he's writing you know he's 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 caught fire so maybe if you can find someone who wants to hear what you're what you're working on if you're willing to kind of let it out as you're writing it that might get you some momentum to just keep that writing rolling. I think local writing groups. Um, you know, we have a local writing group in Kelowna I, I go to, and uh, many of the people are not, not published and they're just flailing around, but they're reading their stuff. They're writing it. They're reading it aloud. Um, they're getting feedback, whether it's good or bad, I don't know, but they're getting some feedback. And I think that it also makes them write. You know, so it's sometimes it's easier not to write. And I think that, you know, even your local writing group can, can help you um, just sit down and write, just to do it. And I really recommend that. And then of course, taking an MFA course is always good as well. There you go, yes, <laughs> sit down and write. And the uh, the structure, of course, of deadlines and accountability and all of those things, whether it's through writing group or through an actual degree, um, is a, a really great uh, assistant in, in getting it done. And also well, write badly. Yes, right? yes. This was a mantra through the program. Just write, you know, mm -hmm. slam it down, write it badly, and then go back later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We do have one one quick question here. And just since we have a minute left, I'll, I'll throw this out to the panelists as well. Um, so, uh, they say, I am also a beginner writer and try as I have, I'm having a hard time to get going. I'm not sure if this is pressure from my kids, trauma, if you're a failure, how did you overcome it? Uh, and how long did it take you to, you know, overcome some of those barriers that you may have had to writing? And, and actually, I like this question because I think we, we get, we'll probably get a variety of answers that get people sitting in the chair and tackling some of those barriers. I'll go. Yeah. Um, I think I just had to overcome it because I needed to do it to survive. That's how I feel about it. I mean, it was my only option. Like, what else was going to do? Just like never write about these things that are so impactful for me and never write through the process of having a major mental health crisis, just kind of sit on it. It wasn't an option for me. So yeah, I think it's just, you know, because you have to, and that's how you get it done. Lots of people will say, oh, did you find it um, therapeutic to write, which it sounds like a cliche, but there's there's real truth in that, that going through the effort of thinking and reflecting on difficult things helps you kind of put them in an order in your head. Uh, and it is therapeutic and it is helpful and it kind of helps you move on from something I think that's difficult. Um, and for me, the, the real barrier was beyond, you know, once I got my head around doing it was finding time. And I think a lot of people struggle to find time, you know, if you're working full time and I was mm -hmm. a single mom with a couple of kids who did so much volleyball and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, but you just, I remember Ken McGugan saying, well, get up at four. Don't, don't give the job all your best time, give you your most energetic time and then go fritter away at the job. Right. Uh -huh. uh, so that's another thing that you kind of have to get your head around is that you really need to devote the time, but it's worth it. Yeah. And I just throw in there too, with my, my high school classes, we talk about the inner critic 
a lot when we're writing. So we have to silence the inner critic and you, you read that in writing books, but it, it's true. I think in my opinion, silence the inner critic, get writing, get rolling and move forward. Don't look back, um, get some momentum and, and let the critic come later. I think that uh, getting over imposter syndrome is is a big thing in writing. You know, that was certainly a big thing with me. Like who someone said already in the question, who wants to read what I'm writing and what qualifies me to write? And I think getting, getting over that is sometimes really tough. Thinking, you know, even being accepted to the MFA program, I had a list of reasons why I was accepted. I was old, I was in BC, I was, you know, there were a million reasons I was accepted, nothing to do with writing. So um, I think that that saying to yourself, it is like, like silencing the inner critic, um, just saying to yourself, yeah, I can write this and then just sit down and give it a go. And you might have to produce a lot of garbage before you get really good compost out of it. Clearly you are a writer, suit. <laughs> what a good sentence to end on. <laughs> Uh, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists. This was a fantastic session and so great to hear both about your process, but also about the kind of bigger uh, experience of, of living a writing life. Um, for those who came in late or want to replay some of this, yes, we will be posting this to our uh, uh, YouTube channel, the University of King's College. We'll have it up there probably by tomorrow. Um, so you can uh, just do a search for that on YouTube and find it there. Um, if you would like more information about the MFA program, uh, you can visit our website. We're just under the uh, the programs tab at the University of King's College uh, main website. Um, and you can write to me, Jillian Turnbull, or any of our cohort directors, Kim Pittaway, Steve, uh, Stephen Kimber, and, and Dean Job, if you have specific questions. Uh, we'll also send out a follow-up email with some uh, pertinent links uh, about the program to all of the attendees uh, tomorrow as well. So um, feel free to be in touch. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of our panelists so again, we had Sue Harper, uh, Jason Schurz, uh, R.C. Shaw, and Pauline Dakin. Uh, thanks for giving us your time today. And uh, I recommend their books to all of you. Um, and we hope to talk to you all soon. Take care and thanks very much. <laughs>